Hi, this is Robin. I'm going to be talking about movable type as an introduction to typography. So, when we're talking about typography, we're actually talking about movable type, and so it's important to understand what movable type is and how it functions. So, the beginning of this, I guess, is the reproduction of text. If you're going to reproduce text, one way that you could do that is with a tool, like a brush or a pen or something. Um, and so if you take a look at the right hand here um, and the upper area here, these are both scribally produced um, pieces of text. So at the top, that's a Carolin, also known as a Carolingian minuscule. Um, and this is from the 9th century Alcuin Bible, so it's a big sort of underpinning of what we now think of as Roman type. And the Carolingian dynast dynasty was sort of what we would now think of as several different modern countries that were grouped together, including Germany and France. And, and this style of lettering was a precursor to this type of black letter type that you see on the lower right hand side. Those are both produced by hand, and so the thing about producing something by hand is each time you do it, it's going to be a bit different, and it's going to contain expression of the person who has written it. The thing about a Carolingian minuscule also is that it was quite time consuming to produce, so if you want to disseminate a lot of different um, copies of a book, it's going to take a long time to do that. You're going to need a team of people who are trained. Uh, on the lower left hand here, you see woodblock printing. This is a relatively early specimen. So woodblock printing means that you are taking a, sort of a, a larger area and filling it in with text and maybe illustrations. Um, so there are more than one usually more than one word, like you could have a full paragraph or a full page altogether. Woodblock printing is also known as xylographic printing, and its origins, uh, I believe, are China, um, dating like to two, 220 in the European calendar, 220 AD. Um, and the way that that would be produced is it's ink, and then it's inked, and then paper is laid on top of it, and, and the hand rubbing technique is used where you rub the, the paper down and peel it off. Movable type, um, as with uh, woodblock printing and paper, was originally uh, invented in China. Um, this is a work by Bi Sheng, um, working in 10, 10 or no, this is sorry, the Pen Cao from 1249, but Bi Sheng developed it in, in 1045. Um, and the reason that he was working on it, he, he created the characters out of clay, and the reason that he was doing this is that there was a, a, a really a sudden increase of demand for written material in the Song Dynasty because there was an increase in literacy and so he was attempting to um, find a sort of faster way to produce printed content. It, it didn't have the same cultural impact um, in China that it did that uh, the printing press had in, in Europe and there are a variety of, of reasons for that. China has a really strong printed tradition, it's just that movable type was not such an important part of it, whereas in, in Europe it was kind of um, signaled a big sea change. Well, the thing about um, examining histories of movable type or any type of type reproduction, or sorry, text reproduction technology, is that there are going to be factors that are commercial, political, cultural, and to do with the actual structure of the language itself that all need to be considered in order to understand it. So I would say the short version of this is just that it was invented quite early on but did not have the same same cultural impact. And so what you're seeing here, each one of these, what makes it movable type, is that each one of these characters um, could be picked up and rearranged and put in a different position and, and, and be used independently of one another as opposed to carving out the whole page. Um, I believe that, that although the type was movable, um, that the hand rubbing technique remained consistent. Um, and at another time, or if any of you are interested, ask me about the differences in, in, in developments in paper in, in Europe and in Asia because they, they follow different trajectories. Um, but one last thing about this, I believe that the characters were organized by rhyme, um, which is, is obviously a different way of organizing the, the, uh, the pieces. Okay, so to give some context uh, for Gutenberg, just to take a look at the, the um, situation that the Gutenberg press comes into. So this is a manuscript in the, from 1260 in Belgium. Um, the 
text is produced, it's a black letter, you can see, and it's produced using a water-based pigment, and then there are illustrations or other ornaments that are added in, in color and sometimes in gold, and it's printed on vellum. So I believe this is printed on vellum. Paper did not make its way into Europe and, until, well, I, I might get this wrong, but I believe it's like a thousand-ish. AD and and there's a, a mill the first paper mill I think is is maybe like an 1100 or, or, or something like that so vellum is still used for for quite a few um, books and so it's if you have manuscript and, and animal skin it's very labor-intensive to produce these books and as a result they're very very valuable and rare <laughs> um, and so on the right hand side here um, you can see um, this is from a research project taking a look at marginalia, things that scribes have written in the corner. And just as a little note here, scribes would all work to, or, or very often work together as a group. So it was kind of like books were very often a group activity. Producing them, people would often read them in groups, read them aloud. And in fact, if you were reading even by yourself, it was very common at this time in Europe that you would be using your vocal cords or reading out loud. That it was the, the it was not such a disconnect between your reading and writing senses, um, and, and, and sorry, your oral senses. And I just thought, I thought these marginalia were quite funny because they're complaints, and people continue to complain quite a bit when they're making books. If this term will be making a book, I guarantee you that you're going to complain a little bit. You're in a long tradition of complainers. Um, so just this one person here, oh, my hand, um, or um, uh, I... I I apologize for the very brief swearish word here, but um, uh, now that I've written the whole thing, for Christ's sake, give me a drink, is not something that I would expect to find written in a Bible, but um, but there we go. So um, so at any rate, that is the that is the situation, more or less the context that that Gutenberg comes into, and then another aspect of that context is development of print culture, and again, very very many of these techniques and so on have some relationship one way or another um, to, to China. I haven't spoken about Korea because it's a slightly separate tradition, but at some point we, we definitely need to, to take a look at that as well because it's quite significant. Um, so there are several different things going on here. Here we have the detail of a block book, so this is xylographically printed again. So this is not using movable type. This is all carved in one block. This is a Bible, and this is from 1465. So it's actually contemporary to the um, be origin, the beginnings of movable type in Europe, but it's not using that technology. It's using an older technology. And the sweep of this type here on the banner is significant. I just want to point that out to you. If you want to lay out type in a, in a sort of um, shape like that, if you do that digitally, it's very easy to achieve that. If you try to do that um, on a woodblock, uh, it's quite easy to do that because you have the flexibility of just carving out that space with your hands. But if you try and produce that with mechanical movable type, it's very, very challenging. Um, and so what you're seeing here is the end of an era that isn't dominated by, by a grid. This is De Re Militari from the 15th century, um, which is kind of a transition point. It's got in it um, a, a woodblock printing, I believe, I believe this is Aldous Minutius who does this, um, this is done in a semi-black letter style, but there are, some, somebody has pointed out that there are notations, corrections in it that you can see that are, are Roman. So you can see these transitions taking place. And the book itself is about different ways to wage warfare, and some of them are very fantastical um, and, and imaginary. They're imagining technology that could be made in order to, to more successfully wage war. So it's partly a how-to guide, but it's also a what-if guide. And what I think is significant about that for our purpose is this is from the 15th century. That combination of technological um, ability and uh, forward-looking to what possibly could come and the transition and the, the styles of, of lettering that are used and so on, I would say we are actually in a period quite similar to that now, where we have a very like we have a mixture of digital and print technology that we're that we're sort of cobbling together to move forward. We're not really fully in a digital era, and so when I look back at this 
period, which I didn't used to actually interest me that much. I've become quite interested to see how they cope with it because I think we're in kind of a similar, a similar spot. Okay, and then on the bottom right here we have Swiss playing cards from 1530. Again, this is post-printing press, but these are, are xylographically produced. So the thing that all three of these have in common is that you are actually seeing a human hand. It's basically as if you're looking at a photo a, co a copy, a photocopy or a picture of something that has been directly produced with somebody's hand. Um, so it's, there's a stronger connection to a scribal tradition there. And the other thing is taking a look at what's being reproduced. So a Bible, religious text, um, there, this would be like more of a how-to, um, and you'll find like guides for medicine and so on like that, um, and then something that's for, for gambling or leisure, sometimes naughtier things. Um, those are those are three different ways that, that printing is used, and that's consistent across different cultures in terms of what you find being reproduced. The religion might change, but the fact that it's a religious text remains consistent and so on. This is uh, Gutenberg's original um, type. So Johann Gutenberg um, is sometimes incorrectly credited as inventing movable type. It, it's probably a clearer thing to say that he he developed a system of mechanizing printing um, and um, invented like the, the tradition of European typography. <laughs> he invented, uh, invented that. He invented the Roman, the, um, uh, an early European font, not a Roman one. So in order to do that, in order to create um, type to produce a, a printed Bible, for example, Gutenberg and the, his head of press, uh, Schaefer, designed a variation of a type of um, lettering called textura, which is a type of black letter. And so here you see it. Now, in order to do that, one of the things that they had to do was think about what letters are used very often, but there's also an additional challenge with um, uh, European alphabetic languages, which is that um, they're read by shape. And so you want the letter forms to fit together um, in such a way that the word feels um, like a solid shape that's easy to read. You also want the spacing between the letters to look consistent, um, and that is optical and not technical. So for example, if you imagine drawing an invisible box around this C and around this F, and then maybe like around an O, and then you put all those letters together and don't, you can't see the boxes that are around them. They won't look actually evenly spaced. So a big challenge of, of setting this kind of um, type is making it look as if a person set it and put those spaces in as they should be. So that's referred to as kerning, and we'll get to that later. So in order to, to, to begin reproducing um, words that look like they were formed more naturally, he, he came up with many more glyphs than you would require in an alphabet itself. So he came up with 290 glyphs, 400, oh, sorry, 47 capitals, 63 lowercase letters, um, a whole bunch of abbreviations. And that would be helpful for like words that you use over and over again, um, kind of like when we have acronyms now in our texts. Um, and he also came up with a lot of ligatures. And the idea there is that you take two different letter forms and t tie them together. That's what a ligature means. Um, and that would be used either to create the illusion of consistent spacing um, or, or stylistically. So these would, this would be a ligature here, this FF, for example, and then five punctuation marks. Um, this is the system, this is more or less the system that he had in place with a punch and a matrix. Um, and that, that remained in place for a really long time until like the 1800s. Um, just a, one, one last thing to mention here. I, I had mentioned that... Um, different types of reproducing text are dependent upon the culture that is developing them. In this case here, type fell in under the province of carving and goldsmithing. So if you take a look at something like this, the thickness of these, um, the strokes that make up these letters, is partly because it needs to be carved out by hand. If you think about how small type in a book is, and then imagine carving out those letters by hand, you're not going to be able to get really tiny, thin details in there. Um, and so this is a, a style of type that can kind of hold up to being carved out. When we get into the 18th century um, in Europe, you start to get sort of very, very fine detailing in letter forms. 
and that 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 is when we depart from a from a carving tradition. But we're still we're still carving our way around here. So the goldsmiths are responsible for a lot of this type design. Um, this is a uh, Fustin Schaefer's Biblia Latina from 1462. So it in Canabula refers to um, like this type of early printed document. It essentially looks like a manuscript, right? And you'll notice that Schaefer is still there, but Gutenberg has disappeared off the credit here, and instead we see Fust. And so what has happened is that Fust was a financial backer of Gutenberg. He called in his credit just before Gutenberg began printing, so it took Gutenberg about 12 years to get his press ready to go. And given how expensive, um, uh, you know, a, a person produced Bible is it cost apparently it cost about um, as much as a car maybe a book would cost about as much as a car it might be like a more there were fancier books that had jewels and relics and then that were priceless but a standard Bible apparently was about was worth as much as a, a car um, so if you can print that all of a sudden it you know you're gonna be making a lot of money but first uh, locked him out and took over the press uh, using Schaefer's um, ability to work the press, and so they began the imprint, and Gut Gutenberg was locked out. Um, they did a beautiful job on this, despite the kind of nastiness preceding that. So this is the Biblia Latina from 1462, and the thing is that you can see here, this mimics something that would look like uh, a printed manuscript, right? If we go back to this, a person who came across it would very likely think that they were looking at of something that was created by hand. And so what happened is Fust and Schaefer, after they'd made some of these Bibles, um, and I should say here, this is woodblock printing that's that's um, set into it. Um, and in fact, there is a, quite a long period of time in which uh, movable, movable type is supplemented either with a scribal tradition, where you have like a, a somebody who's trained in calligraphy decorating pages by hand, or sort of like um, xylographic printing, which would be this, like woodblock printing that's inset. So this is a combination of technologies. Um, anyway, they, they, had a, they had a suitcase of these Bibles, Fust and Schaefer did, and they took them to Paris to sell. Um, and my understanding is that the Parisian authorities, in looking at this, and in finding that all of these books looked exactly, exactly the same, which didn't make sense if something is produced by hand, every edition is going to be different. Um, became really concerned that this had been produced by witchcraft <laughs> because they weren't familiar with um, mechanizing um, technology at that stage. So um, they arrested them and these two nearly got burnt with their Bibles is my understanding. Um, they were let off and they, they eventually actually opened a, an office in Paris and that speaks partly to something that I think is worth spending a second on. Fust and Schaefer and Gutenberg are coming out of, uh, are not coming out of exactly a French tradition, they're coming out of, I mean, that the, geographically everything shifted, right? But at this particular time, they would be coming out of more of a German tradition. And yet, um, this type of lettering, this black letter lettering, does not continue to dominate Western printing, right? Probably most of the people in our class, including me, have never read a book typeset in black letter. I've never read a book typeset in black letter. So th there's a reason for that, and the reason for that is that um, the Roman letter form takes over, and we will refer to this kind of style of type as either Roman or Latin because it has a connection to Rome as well as the Carolingian Empire, which also has a connection to Rome. So if you think about like 16th century or Renaissance era um, art, for example, it's very dominated by what we would now refer to as as Italy. So you know, Florence and and Venice have a very strong influences on European culture at that time, and France begins to take over that a few centuries later. Um, part of the reason that this shows up in typography, we refer to this as Roman orthography. And I would prefer to refer to this as Roman orthography than English orthography, because English orthography has mu um, much more of a, a German connection to it. But anyway, what happens is when the printing press gets going, although the printing press itself is coming out of more of a German tradition, the people who design for it 
are coming out of more of a French and Italian tradition. So, for example, um, uh, Paris is a, a really significant um, um, choice for Fust and Schaefer to set up an office. And it's partly because not only does France have a very strong tradition of excellence in calligraphy, I mean, France has a, has a reputation for being, um, for aesthetic and design excellence, right? It, it was the case at that time too, so they had really good calligraphy there. And also the French king, the, the, the French court, took an interest in type very early on and began investing in printing presses and designing for printing presses through the university, and they were pulling from the Latin tradition. Um, and and uh, in Venice, there were there, there's a, a history of French typographers working in, in in Venice and designing type there. So it begins to what we what we now think of as like standard um, European writing. It is has got that that cultural mark to it, even though the technology itself is not from that area. It's a little bit tricky to talk about, especially because maybe I need to put a map in front of me. But the geographical um, areas shift, but I just I just think that there are cultural cultural points that are important. So this is uh, Albrecht Durer from 1525, and what's going on here? He's taking a look at black letter, and you can see that he's thinking about how can I map this out in repeatable units, in mechanically repeatable units. So it you can see a shift in the way that people are thinking about letters as opposed to something that you produce with your hand organically. How do you make it so that it it um, is standardized essentially? And then here, this is Geoffrey Torrey in 1529, um, and he's looking, first of all, like, how can you organize this cue on a grid? So he's thinking really early about the impact of the grid on, on, on lettering. Um, and then this is a little fantasy alphabet that he's put together um, where he's looking at tools and sort of turning them into the Roman alphabet. Okay, so we've talked about a few terms. I'm going to go back over some of them because they'll be helpful to us. This term, one of them is black letter. So black letter, there's a variety of different styles that we associate with black letter. Probably a lot of you uh, have access to a font that looks like this, but a fractor. Um, this is a less common one. This is a, from the Vice Foundry. I just really love this one. <laughs> I just think it's really nice. And then on the upper left hand here, we have a font that's called Bastard Fat which is by Jonathan Barnbrook in 1995. And so there's a couple of things that are that are, are important about this, even though it's not an important font itself. One of them is that it is pulling from a black letter tradition, but it's stylizing it. So this does not look like a mimic of a black letter font, it's a, but it's a variation on it. And the name Bastard Fat, it sounds rude, right? And he's playing around with, with, the, with the name, but the name is, is also there's a reason behind it. Bastarda is a style of black letter, and fat is a way of referring to a weight of font or a heaviness of font. So it's legitimate. Oh, that's a weird um, <laughs> choice. It's legitimate to call it bastard fat. Um, it's not just like he randomly pulled out a, you know, some rude words to describe it. He's playing around with the history and the terminology and so on of that. So that's black letter. And again, um, uh, this is not what we what we think of as like a modern um, font is still used in in places that that it's traditional to. So like when I have German students, for example, they're more familiar with it and and feel more comfortable reading in it. As I said, I've never read any anything long form in it. Um, another category that we've looked at is Roman, and another word for Roman could be Latin. I say Roman, so this would be Roman orthography here. And this is a Venetian font, and uh, it's produced or, or designed. Uh, the origins of it are are a French Nicholas, a, a French designer named Nicholas Jensen, who's working in Venice, and Venice was a huge cultural um, and uh, financial center uh, at this time. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time here because we're going to come back to it. But this would be an example of a ligature. The I has been removed, so it doesn't clash with the F, and the two um, letters together have been unified into a single glyph. Uh, this is a discretionary ligature. This is not designed for ease of typesetting. It's designed for visual impact, and that's what makes it discretionary. You can choose to use it or not. This is a, like a, a simple ampersand. That means and. So keep your eye on this, and also keep your eye on this lowercase a. 
this uh, type of font, if you have like Garamond or Bember or whatever, you'll notice that they often have two sets of numerals, and some of those numerals are designed to flow in with the text, and some are designed more for um, uh, scanning for you know mathematical purposes if you have a table of numbers or earnings report or something. We'll talk about that more later on in the term. Okay, so just keep your eye on that ampersand and the lowercase a there. Okay, so there's the lowercase a. Let's go back. So you'll see that that A is changing, right? We're now in an italic. So we looked at black letter, we looked at Roman, now we're in an italic. Why is the italic A different than the Roman A in Jensen? If you're looking at many of the fonts that you have, if you italicize the A, you will see that shift take place. The, word, the way that we would describe this could be that this is a double story A, and this is a single story A. The reason that you see that shift, you'll actually notice once you start paying attention, you notice that many letters shift quite dramatically when you italicize it and also like often take up less space, right? It's because italic has a separate tradition to Roman. When ita italic type was first developed, it was its own style of type and you would set a book in italic or you would set a type in Roman. As our language needs changed and our printing um, tradition changed, we begin to make italic a subsidiary of Roman so that we use Roman as part of a larger, sorry, we use italics as part of a larger Roman family for emphasis or for a proper name or whatever. But it wasn't always that way. And part of what's interesting about that is that written language and language are always changing. So if we were to fast forward 200 years from now, there are going to be a lot of changes to these orthographies um, still. The, the, the orthography changes constantly, like even just looking um, from the, the black letter, uh, you know, 12th century stuff that we were looking at at the beginning to, to this is a big, big shift. This would be considered in the 15th century, um, 15th and 16th century, uh, modern, to look very modern. Um, and it is modern. Um, I'll talk about that more later. I suddenly wanted to, to dive into a whole separate thing and then I'll keep you here for hours and not be happy with me. So at any rate, the point is, is we have black letter, Roman, italic, and these are all separate traditions and part of ongoing, ongoing changes. So uh, that that's the, the A. You'll, you'll see the same thing happen with the G and actually with lots of other letters. The other thing that I wanted to draw your attention to is the ampersand. If you have an interest in this particular style of type, Again, you could look, take a look at your Garamond or Bembo or, or what have you. If you italicize the ampersand, it completely changes. But it means the same thing. It sort of lives outside of the Roman italic universe. You can use an italic ampersand in Roman, in a block of Roman type, and it won't be out of place. You can see more clearly when it's italicized the letter forms that are here. These are two letter forms, E and T. Either A in French for and or et in, in uh, Latin. And then a fourth version here, I'll just throw this in, is, is ornamental type. Ornamental type is really not so much for reading, right? It's for looking at. So this is designed to be really comfortable to read. Okay, so a few more things. I'm going to get into anatomy and a few pieces of terminology. So this might be a space where you want to bookmark it or, or take notes because I'll, I'll give you some information that you'll want to use again. So the difference between a typeface and a font, there is actually a difference. The good news is if you mix these two up, it's one of the few times when it really doesn't matter too much, nobody's going to get upset. Um, the typeface is the design of the type and the font is the usable form of the type um, that, that, that you can make. So that could be, you could have a digital font or you could have a metal font that you ink up and use. Those are, are manifestations to, 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 that are made from the original design. So it's kind of like the example I use in my brain to explain it to myself is like you could have a, a design for um, some clothing, but you have to like actually put it into a wearable form to use it or you have to put it into production. Um, and so the typeface is just kind of the, the plan. So if you take a look here, for example, this would be using Nicholas Jensen as an example. This is Nicholas Jensen's original Roman type. And when you zoom into it, you can see how rough the technology is. Like you'd be losing a lot of detail there that we don't we don't lose digitally. Um, anyway, this, so this would be a metal 
font of his of his uh, design, and this would be a digital font of it. So if you have, for example, Adobe Jensen Pro Lite caption, um, this part you don't need to remember all this, I'm just putting it out there. Adobe would be the foundry, Jensen would be the design, the format would be pro, the weight would be light. Caption refers to the optical size, so like it's kind of telling you that you would maybe want to use it for like a subheading or a caption or something, um, as opposed to um, like a like long form text, that type of thing. And then a little extra twist in it is the market, how you get it. So the, the this would kind of almost be the store that you buy the brand in. <laughs> so for example, Typekit is a place that um, provides like a subscription model service to license fonts to use. So you don't Whereas in Nicholas Jensen time, you would buy this metal font and then have it. You'd only have a handful of fonts. Nowadays, you have lots and lots of digital fonts. And so one of the shifts that has changed is that instead of buying digital fonts, um, many people switch to a subscription model. So if you're using Adobe Creative Cloud, for example, they use Typekit as a... As a, as a I can't remember the legal term for this, but they're... they're they harness Typekit's um, access to these fonts as a way to get them to you. So when you license Creative Cloud, you have access to Typekit Marketplace. Um, yeah. So, okay, so that would be Jensen. And also, just sort of, when you see a digital font of something like Jensen that's gone through several centuries, you're seeing something that's not exactly the same very often. Several other designers may have intervened in the meantime. Okay, this is our last slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about anatomy, and we'll be covering anatomy again next week, but I'm going to go over um, uh, a handful of terms here. So the baseline is kind of like the invisible line that um, the letter forms all sit on to be nice and straight. So if you have um, um, a string of letters like this, some of them are going to be hanging below the baseline with a descender, um, but for the most part, you can see that they're lined up on this baseline. Um, there is um, height to the to the different letter forms, right? So if you draw um, or you, you measure from the baseline of an uppercase letter like this T, that would tell you what the cap height is. There are some cases where an ascender, which is a part of a letter form that pops up, um, an ascender might match a cap height. It might also be higher or lower than the cap height. It's not always the same. So for example, Futura, which is a very well-known font that you might already be familiar with, um, many of the ascenders in that um, don't match the cap height. And the lowercase l, for example, exceeds the cap height. So they're, they're, the shape of that is, is sort of a little bit inconsistent. You'll notice that there's another line here that's called the X height, and that's essentially the height of the lowercase letter when there isn't an ascender uh, in place. And I, I think it's called the X height because you could measure a lowercase x with it. But I'm not totally sure actually why. Um, anyway, that's the X height. So if you have a font like Helvetica, the difference between the cap height in Helvetica and the lowercase um, letters here is quite slight. This E is not that much shorter than the R, whereas if you have Mrs. E's, the height of the lowercase letter is significantly smaller than the uppercase letter. So what happens in that case is that this makes for a very, uh, the, much more of a shape. Um, so for example, if I'm reading a book, if I'm reading text, this actually might be more comfortable to read on a printed page. But it also means it sets a bit small. So if you're looking at screen or if you're in some sort of stress condition, like uh, subtitles, for example, are quite stressed, um, then uh, this actually becomes easier to read. There are other reasons for that, and when we get to type on screen, we'll talk about that. But the short version is that this is a generous X height, and this is a small X height. So when you're looking at fonts over the next couple of weeks, you could look to yourself and sort of begin to notice, does it have a serif? Or is it a sans serif? Is it a Roman? Is it an italic? Is it a black letter? Um, if you're not looking at a Roman orthography, you could also think about other variations on that. For example, is there a reference to tool implied? So for example, Helvetica, there's not much reference to tool. And here you can see evidence of a pen. It's quite calligraphic in the, the thin parts and the, and the thick parts and so on. Um, 
axis I'm going to finish with here because axis is helpful but it, it, it can take you a little bit of time for your mind to wrap around. So let's, let's end with axis and you can keep your eye out for that. So as I mentioned, this type of font here has quite a bit of what's called stroke modulation where some of the areas are thinner and some are thicker and that is partly again a reference to a calligraphic uh, uh, tradition. Um, if you are a right-handed person and you form the letter O with your right hand, there is a tilt to that. I'm completely forgetting what the tilt is. I want to say 35 degrees, but it, it might not be the case. I'm a left-handed person. <laughs> um, so when you form it, the way, that you're, the, the way that you press down on the pen, you get some areas that are thicker and some are areas that are thinner. And the thin areas, if you were to line them up, are at this tilted axis, which again, I think is 35 degrees. So the axis of this O, for example, um, is what we would refer to here as a humanist axis, meaning it looks like it was made by a right-handed person writing. So at this stage, nobody is expecting you to be able to um, identify when a humanist axis is going on. It's fine if you don't. But just to be aware that, that letter forms do have an axis, an, an axis um, and that, that you can determine it um, by taking a look at where that modulation occurs. Um, so over the course of the term, I'll point out other, other axes when they're, when they're in place. So that would be an axis. Okay, so I feel like we covered a lot. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions in class. And the next lecture that I do about anatomy will be looking at specific fonts and what um, classifications they might fall under. Okay, thanks for your attention today.